lecture 30 of ECE 5312. And so what we're going to do is we're going to build upon what we saw in lecture 29 with multi-carrier modulation. And I, I promised you guys the trick as to why almost every communication system uses multi-carrier modulation nowadays, commercially for wired, wireless, optical. And it comes down to three very simple letters, FFT. So what happens is the, the Salz, Burton Salzburg paper implementation of this in the 1960s, they didn't have the FFT at that time. I'm not sure, maybe, can, maybe someone can double check. But I'm quite sure they didn't have an FFT at that time, right? They almost didn't, don't have like computing technology the way we know it at that time, right? So what happens is it came out in a paper, and you'll see it in your problem sets that I've just posted online. There was a very interesting paper that was developed that said, you know what? Like, I don't know where these people come up and figure out these things. I think, it, seriously, it's Friday nights hanging out with friends, and then they get a brainstorm. Seriously. So there are two people, Ebert and Weinstein. And so they're from Bell Labs, you know, the mecca of electrical and computer engineering. I, before they shut down or were a shell of their former self, like anybody who was anybody in electrical and computer engineering in North America went through Bell Labs. That was like the place, you know. Nowadays, not so much, right? So what happened is these guys, they looked at Salzburg's formulation and they say, wow, why so many cosine modulation? Why, why like so much filtering? This is, you can't implement that in, in anything and be practical, right? It's going to cost a fortune, all those oscill uh, oscillators. Why don't you have frequency offsets? It's going to be a mess. Then they did the math. They looked at the math. Mathematically, what this is, how does this look like? And they say, gee whiz. If we move it like this and like that, this almost looks like a discrete Fourier transform. And so that's what happened. What happens is they realize, if you read Ebert's and Weinstein's paper, you'll see that they were able to go from Salzburg's realization to one that is exclusively IDFT and DFT based. Inverse discrete Fourier transform and discrete Fourier transform based. What is an efficient way of implementing that? The fast Fourier transform and inverse Fourier transform. What is the fastest fast Fourier transform? It's the fastest Fourier transform in the West, the FFTW, right? So if you have that IP core on that FPGA, you slap it all together, boom, right? Even better, if you have a chip solution for that, why do you think, like, you know, if you have a wi like Wi-Fi, like, you know, is Wi-Fi the most expensive thing on your laptop? Absolutely not, right? And, and it's all because of that sort of, like, looking at a different perspective, plus looking at the fact, even in the 1980s when this first came out, and then some other people followed suit, uh, most notably Hirosaki. So he came up with two papers um, that talked about offset um, uh, offset QAM, or OQAM, which is based on a similar pr perspective. So what happens is, this is how multi-carrier modulation is implemented efficiently. So your book goes through a lot of rigorous math. Okay. And so what happens is, like for instance, if you have MRE QAM, you can re represent the k subcarrier by cosine and sine modulated amplitude in both the i and q domains. And then you take the real. But, um, you know, really, let, let's actually draw what multi-carrier modulation looks like. Okay. So the way it would work is the following. So let's say you take, so your transmitter. So you take your high speed data, your x of n, and what would you do? Serial to parallel convert it. So now you have those n subcarriers, right? Um, then, like, let's assume like x of n is already modulated for the sake of simplicity. What you would do is you would do, you might think do FFT first or DFT first. No. Mathematically, it turns out you do the IFFT first. 
then what happens is it turns out there is a problem with this specific waveform. So what happens is, if you look at this guy, you might say, okay, how do I, like, you know, what is, what's the, what is the dual of this guy in, in terms of, like, the, in terms of the frequency, uh, frequency domain and time domain of a synthesis filter bank? And it turns out it's a collection of sync pulses in the time domain, right? And in the frequency domain, it is nothing more than, you know, rectangular pulses, right, or rectangular signals. What happens is that's not such a good thing because what do we know about sync pulses? If you don't sample it right, lots of ISI, right? So there is that issue of OFDM, but we'll get back to that in a minute. The other thing about OFDM, what is, what is the most important thing? So let's say we draw this now, for now. Let's say we do the parallel to serial conversion, and you have your composite OFDM signal, right? So let's say we take the OFDM signal, okay? So let's say that is K minus 1, K, K plus 1, K plus 2, okay? And then at the receiver, you take your receive signal, R of N, SP, you take your FFT, and then you do your ah. PS, and then you have your reconstructed signal. Now here's the problem. All of this works when you have no ISI. What do I mean by that? This is what I mean. What happens is, as long as this K minus 1 symbol, all the samples in it stay within the K minus 1 period, you're good. Because the IFFT created it, and the FFT just reverses it, right? The problem is, if now I have some smearing because of the dispersive channel, What happens if the K minus 1 stuff begins to go into the K, and the K goes into K plus 1, and the K plus 1 goes into K plus 2? Now you don't have segregated symbols. So now your FFT over here cannot undo what the IFFT did. Oops. So what do people do? So one of several techniques, I have a friend who did this, one of several things. So what he did is he said, I am going to put a space. I'm going to put zeros in between each OFDM symbol. Right? And so what happens is if you have that dispersiveness, it gets caught here, and that's what you throw away before you process it in the FFT. Right? So any dispersion gets thrown away, and therefore you can actually extract. But there is an even smarter technique, and this actually helps also with synchronization. Cyclic extension. What you do is you can take, so I'm going to erase that again. What you can do, bless you, you can do the following. You can take this guy, you can take this guy, you can take this guy. I'm then going to take him, 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 and then copy to the beginning. I'm going to take him, I should have made a bigger copy, and then same thing. So this is the exact same information as the end here, right? And I'm just copying to the beginning, but that's the official start and end of one symbol. That's the official start and end. And so what happens is if I have any smearing, from the previous symbol in, it does not matter. Because what happens is it gets caught by the cyclic copy that's at the beginning, which gets thrown out at the receiver. But what happens about the stuff that's in the cyclic? It gets smeared, but it's the same information, just in a different time instant, but it does not matter. Because what does the, uh, the FFT does? 
it just mis it mis mismatches everything back into the original signal. So as long as the original samples are there, it doesn't matter where they are in time, they will be able to reconstruct it. So what's even nicer, if you do in the time domain a correlator, what will you see in terms of correlation? You'll see the following. If you take a correlator and you try and t take a OFDM symbol or a series of OFDM symbols, what you're going to see is this and then this. This and then this. You're going to see a small correlation bump and then a huge one. The small one corresponding to the start of the cyclic extension and then the big one for actual OFDM symbol when you have an exact match. So beautiful. So this additional information gives you a little bit of insight on what you're receiving. So if you're trying to lock on to which symbol is there, you can use that information. All right? Yes? Why do you take the back and not double the front? Uh, so why do you take the back instead of double the front? Um, the, the, the answer is you can, you can do whatever you want. So, so some people, what they do is they also do something called a cyclic suffix. They take the front and dump it at the back. Any which way works. But the nice thing about taking the back and moving to the front is that of the uh, cyclical properties that the symbol will have. So you have some sort of cyclostationary type of behavior. If you take the front and copy it twice, you don't have that cyclo, uh, a cyclic type of behavior. But on the other hand, if you take the end and put it at the beginning, it almost looks like, oh, it's repeating itself, right? Even for a little bit. Good question. Good question. All right. So the math that I have here is, again, like this is how we represent our transmission in terms of, let's say if you have a QAM, each symbol on every subcarrier will have an amplitude and will have a phase, right? And so what ends up happening is there's also channel attenuation. Okay. So when you have the subcarrier become sufficiently narrow, and that's the buzzword, sufficiently narrow, then you can represent, so you saw how I represent QAM in terms of an amplitude and a phase response, right? The channel attenuation can be represented by a complex weight, the magnitude of CK, and also another phase as well. So as long as you have a complex gain at the receiver to undo CK e to the J phi K for every subcarrier, you're set. That's all you need in terms of equalizer. So you have a very complex receiver and transmitter structure without any attenu uh, you know, channel attenuations or imperfections, but then you implement your equalizer. Equalizer tap, equalizer tap, equalizer tap, one per subcarrier. Beautiful. One problem, what happens if you have 1,024 equalize, uh, 1,024 1, subcarriers? One tap for each unless your channel doesn't change much across 10 or 5 subcarriers, in which case you can use the same gain across every 5 to 10. Right? There are little tricks you can play. Ha ha ha! Tricks. So what happens is that all this map that I'm I have on here, really what it describes are how does the channel negatively impact your OFDM or, um, or your multi-carrier transmission, and what OFDM does, which is essentially, I'm going to go to the punchline. Your received subcarrier information looks something like this. You have your magnitude, it's attenuating your data, and you have some pesky noise, right? For subcarrier K. And so what you want to do is you want to invert that CK. Now I mentioned this before. If you have noise, and if k is a small number, the inverse of it is going to be a very large number. And what happens to the noise? So your SNR doesn't change. It's still pretty poor. So you might want to do pre-equalization. You do the inversing. At, but now, what are the issues with that? I mentioned one, feedback channel and delay. What's another one? dynamic range of your RF front end. Imagine if you amplify your signal to counteract the attenuation of a channel, the big problem with OFDM, and the, my, one of my first PhD students I co-advised at the University of Kansas, his entire PhD dissertation was about something called peak to average power ratio, or PAR. 
What happens is if you have 1,024 tiny little transmissions with wildly varying amplitude values, what happens when you add them together? You can get really serious constructive combination of those subcarriers. And what happens is you risk having a transmitted signal before it gets to the RF front end that once you send it over the RF front end, the dynamic range doesn't support it and it clips the signal. So how does that look like? Looks like this. So suppose my first subcarrier, let's say it looks like that. Okay? No, no semblance to real life. So that's subcarrier one. Let's say subcarrier two looks like that. Subcarrier three. Subcarrier 4, you know where I'm going with this, right? <laughs> so what happens is if you add these guys together, what do you get? You're going to get something that looks like this. They're going to be summed together, super peak, something like that. Now, I know this is confusing. Suppose that your R front end, the dynamic range, supports a transmission up to this much. What happens to this guy here? He gets clipped. Clipping is very bad for a wireless transmission. Why? Because when you clip a wireless signal, it creates lots of spurious out-of-band emissions. It makes a lot of interference. And it's also disastrous in terms of error recovery at the receiver. It's not good. But then again, what happens is you need to ask yourself, if you have a really good R front end, how often will this occur? Is par real issue? There were some Japanese researchers, I think they published a paper in like uh, 2006, which said if you look at an OFDM transmitter, and you look at, let's say, a typical dynamic range of like, you know, a decent Wi-Fi card and stuff, they say the occurrence of, of getting clipping, disastrous clipping, is like one out of every 10 to the 8 or something. It's something like ridiculously high. Like, you know, this huge number, but I mean, one out of that. So it's actually really low probability that you get a disastrous clipping event. And then people say, well, your error coding should just pick up the slack if it can't recover it. So there's an occasional zip, 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 zip. You know who actually came up with a really interesting design to counteract clipping? There's a guy by the name of John Chioffi. He's at Stanford University. He has his own company. He had a wonderful patent. And he came up with a way where if you had a signal that was clipped, he can be able to, at the receiver, to recover what the symbol was doing. Great patent. Also, he's pretty well to do. So, you know, when I go to California, that BMW or Mercedes I see drive by, no, no, that's not him. That's probably one of his kids. And he's in the Aston Martin right in front of it. So, you know. No, but, but in all seriousness, he, he, him and his students do fantastic work in this area because um, he did a lot of things in terms of like DSL and multi care modulation in that, that regard. And his patent is pretty interesting. So, okay. So, 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 sort of formulation. And just like what I mentioned before, you can get noise enhancement if you try and equalize at the receiver just by simply inverting the gain. But more importantly, you also have shape noise if, let's say, your equalizer is anything other than flat, right? So if it's flat, that's one thing. It's a gain, but it's amplified. If you happen to do what I did in my PhD thesis, which is have, like, you know, fancy equalizers and stuff and shaped and everything, now it gets kind of messy, right? And then you now, instead of doing noise enhancement, you also have non-white noise. <laughs> okay? So... As I was mentioning, some really special features about OFDM. And what is the most special one of them all? So let's say we look in the frequency domain. Frequency domain. Remember I said something about sync pulses? What happens is,
this is the next. So notice, look how, look how with the, the subcarriers, they're kind of overlapping, aren't they? Okay, and I can keep on drawing. Look at how these subcarriers are like maximally overlapping, right? With regular multi-carrier modulation. So I mentioned the thesis by Ravi Ramachandran. So he's actually now at a professor at Rowan University. So if any of you go to the southern part of New Jersey, say hello to him for me. Okay. What happens is, what, what he did and many others like him, is they looked at multi-carrier modulation and there's something called perfect reconstruction. This is the idea that if you transmit information down these separate subcarriers, that you'll be able to perfectly reconstruct them at the receiver. Now, in order to do that, especially if you have overlapping subcarriers, is you have to have some sort of very specific orthogonality principles in place and that comes in with the design of those filters, the analysis and system filters to achieve that. What OFDM does, that's taken care of. How is that accomplished? It turns out that every subcarrier next to each other is 90 degrees out of phase. They're orthogonal by design, right? So the subcarrier here, this guy, he's orthogonal to him, who's orthogonal to him, who's orthogonal. So it's this intermixing of orthogonality. What happens is, how about this guy and this guy? They're not orthogonal. They're totally in phase. So you want to keep them separate. But what does that mean? We can overlap subcarriers almost. We can overlap them 50% with each other all the way across the band. So in terms of spectrally efficient, is this spectrally efficient? You betcha. This is really spectrally efficient. Imagine you have 1,024 of these. These guys get squished together like sardines in a can, perfectly compressed together. Right? That's the beautiful thing about OFTM. So if you look at the spectra, too bad, like, you know, actually, we sh like, you know, try it out at home in MATLAB. What happens is, and just like what I wrote here, what happens is the separation between these guys is 1 over T. Haha. <laughs> I can't see. Thank you. It's a long night. <laughs> but what happens is the separation between these two guys are just 1 over t, the symbol period separation. So very powerful stuff. Not 1 over 2t, 1 over t. We're talking really, really tightly packed signals with each other. So what happens is how does this look like spectrally? So I have a kind of an okay diagram to show you guys. This is it. So general multi-carrier kind of looks like this. I can tell you, if you're looking for a cool signal processing thesis to work on that would take quite a while to achieve and it's really neat and it deals with multi-carrier, try and come up with concepts or filter designs to design filters really efficiently that can be um, represented in parallel frequency bins as close together as possible. So Ramachandran's PhD dissertation was all about that. The condition of perfect reconstruction, near perfect reconstruction, and all based off of a prototype filter. Because imagine if you had to design 1,024 filters, would you do that by hand? Next week's class test. No, just kidding. What happens is most people use something called what they, they call a prototype filter prototype low-pass filter that you modulate to a desired frequency, right? Now, suppose not only do you modulate it to a specific center frequency, you also select in it a specific phase. So that filter next to another one, next to another one, next to another one, they're all orthogonal. That's what Ramachandran showed. And there are other people who did similar. If you notice, multi-care in general still, even in, under the best of circumstances, can only overlap so much. OFDM, maximally overlapped without going into the next symbol. 
So that's this guy, coupled with the fact that it can be implemented using an FFT and an IFFT, makes OFDM absolutely fantastic. I hope I'm convincing people here. No, just kidding. So what does OFDM look like? The transceiver model. So just like what I drew on the board, so what you have is you have the serial to parallel converter that then takes the IFFT of every subcarrier. This is where you add the cyclic prefix. So that's where you take, you can also add the cyclic su suffix. It doesn't really matter as long as Then you parallel the serial convert it, digitally to analog convert it, send it to the RF front end to bring it to an RF frequency. Receiver picks it up, brings it down to baseband, analog to digital converts it, signal to a serial to parallel converts it, removes the cyclic prefix, takes the FFT, you have a detector to determine if there's like, you know, um, you know what symbol it is, and then you parallel the serial convert to get the reconstructed version of that. So what ends up happening is it's almost like the dual, but what's at the core is this FFT and IFFT. So if you wanted to represent this in terms of IFFT and FFT modules, the first thing we would do is use the DFT and IDFT expressions, which we have over here. This is exactly, so part of your problem set for this coming week, and I actually provide the reference in the handout, is you've got to read Weinstein and Everett's paper. And as opposed to many transaction journal papers, this one's an easy read. It's like, if you love DFTs, this is this is a lovely read. Like, you know, take it, print it out tonight. Look at it, and it's like, ah, this is interesting, you know. And then wake up, and you're drooling on your paper. No, just kidding. Happens to me all the time. So what happens is, yes. Mm-hmm. Why? Where? Which one? This one? Yeah. No. So think about, okay. This is a great segue into why that is. So, so, so the question is, isn't it supposed to be a summation rather than a parallel serial? And the answer is the, the addition, the summation's already taken care of. How? So do you remember what an FFT butterfly looks like? So it depends if, so it looks like that, and then there's a multiply, there's some adds. So here's the adders, right? There's, depending if you're doing decimation in time or decimation in frequency, you, ha you, you have a certain layout in terms of where the multiply is, where the adds are, where to, uh, you know. And what happens is, as you've seen, suppose you have, let's say, one, two, three, four. What would you have? Well, let's say you do this. Right? And then you would do that. So you would have two FFT butterfly. So you have two F you have this stage, and then you would have this stage. And then if you want to do eight, you would have a cascade of these. So what is effectively happening here? So in the case of I forgot if this decimation in time or decimation frequency, but what happens is you're taking all the inputs and you're decomposing them into their respective frequency bins and you're summing them together. That's why I was mentioning with a cyclic extension, it doesn't really matter, because in the end, everything gets summed together and its frequencies get decomposed. Or, on the other hand, their frequencies get sort of synthesized in the process. Now, what happens is the output of this is already, so in a matter of speaking, the IFFT already did the summation for you. Now we just need to take it from an to packets and send it out. So this is all the adding for you, but it doesn't lay it out in a serial sequence. The this, so the output of this, so let me use a different color. The output of this is like this. You need to take that and represent it like that. That's where the parallel serial converter comes in. Okay? So that's a good question. But what happens is the beauty of the what happens is it does all your modulation to different frequencies. It takes the different components. It does the interpolation for you. It does almost everything for you in this one nice, convenient little block. 
And all you have to do is put a P to S at the end of it to make it serial. Ta-da! You know, isn't it wonderful? You know, I would, I, I swear, everyone should read Weinstein and Everett's paper. The thing, I bet you, I'm not sure how many people here, I'm going to do a survey. So how many people here reads journal papers somewhat regularly? Journal paper people reading? Journal, journal readers? Depends. But okay, okay. How many of you, when you look at a journal paper that you're about to read, the first thing you do is you go to the end and see if it has a biography with photographs and you read the bios. Almost everyone, because it's like, you know, the most interesting part of the paper is, oh, he studied at York University. Very interesting. Like, you know, it's, it's embarrassing, isn't it? It's like, it's, it's almost like a form of procrastination before you jump into the paper. Oh, no, no, let's look at the bio of the author, like, you know, just for kicks. Oh, that's so funny. Let's look at him on the website. Does he actually have the same? No, just kidding. I think, unfortunately, it is. Like, you know, I heard that you got... It's sad. You know, our lives have reduced down to... No, I'm just kidding. So, yeah, so that's... So what happens is, you know, you go through this process, and I would say, you know, all of this is about the same. Like, you know, you have the IDFT and you have the DFT. Check out Weinstein and Ebert's paper. Like, go through the math. Um, you only need to go through the first three pages. It's really straightforward in terms of how they went about getting, going from cosine modulated subcarriers to one where it's all IDFT and DFT based. Okay. IEEE Explorer has it, so I would log into a computer here on campus because we have access to that, download the paper, print it out, check it out, embrace it. It's seminal. It's a great paper. Now, here's the other thing. I mentioned this already, so that's why we're going to conclude today's lecture on this topic, is the idea of the cyclic prefix. There's also something called the cyclic suffix, but I almost never see anybody talk about CS before. And just like what I mentioned, the cyclic extension is to capture all the dispersion of the channel because what happens is if you have ISI, intersymbol interference, between different OFTM symbols, you will not be able to perfectly recover at the DFT or the FFT at the receiver because you have this unknown information that's added to your symbol, so you won't be able to, you, you'll say, what the heck, what is this thing? One thing that should be noted, there are two things in OFDM. ISI, that's the bad stuff. That's why we have the cyclic extension. There's also something called ICI, or intercarrier interference. This is when one carrier spreads into the next one. That's easy to handle. In the frequency domain, what do you have? It's just a gain, just a weight, and you just equalize it out, right? So on that note, what do we learn in today's class? So there was a lot of math, but I think I'm really looking for the concept here. What we saw is that if you, instead of using an analysis filter bank and a, a synthesis filter bank, use an FFT and an IFFT, you get the exact same sort of multi-carrier characteristic as you would do as a multi-carrier communication system, but with cheaper hardware, more computationally efficient. When does it become really computationally efficient? When it's base two, right? It's also spectrally efficient because all the subcarriers are mucho compressed together. It's great. And very importantly, we have to... What is the problem with the cyclic extension? Overhead information. Do you think the cyclic extension is useful information with the transmission of data? No, it carries no useful additional information. So, so here's a question. In Wi-Fi, how, what percentage of the transmitted OFDM symbol in Wi-Fi is a cyclic extension? Yes. It's yes. It's one quarter of the symbol. That's one quarter of wasted symbol. But it's necessary. Otherwise, no worky. So with that said, that is lecture 30 of ECE 5312. Okay, so I posted the problem set online with solutions, lots of OFDM stuff, lots of multi-carrier stuff, 